question for Isabel Gunn. Um, and uh, Isabel, we are joined by your committee, uh, your supervisor, uh, Professor Etkind, uh, your second reader, Professor uh, Papa Theodoru, and we're also joined by two external reviewers. Uh, we have uh, Mitchell May, from uh, a former graduate of TMU, uh, uh, DAS, uh, is it DAS TMU? Sorry, it's all new to everyone. Um, and he is currently working for uh, Joey Giamo, uh, architect uh, in downtown Toronto. And uh, we're also joined by TMU RCIT, TMU at RCIT, RCIT at TMU, uh, uh, faculty member uh, Drew Furman, uh, that's the School of Interior Design. Um, and of course, uh, just to keep me in check. Oh, I was gonna say, just to keep me in check is Professor Marco Polo, the program uh, director. Um, in instances like this, Marco, with the supervisor, we should await the return? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so we, we may be dealing with a spotty connection. So let's give Masha a minute. Here she okay. comes. Excellent, okay. excellent. So um, Professor Atkin, if it's okay, uh, the camera, just because your you're, uh, bandwidth, if you want to keep your camera off, that, that's fine. But can you hear us? She, she may still be joining us or she may just be on mute. Masha, okay. can, you, can you hear us? She's like, uh, okay. Um, let's, let's just give her a moment. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll send a message to the chat. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, and yeah, sorry for the technical gaffes, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I just uh, think, uh, just as, as we're trying to get uh, Professor Atkin on board, um, Isabel, you are going to be given about 20 minutes. I'll give you a three minute warning if that's okay with you. I'll just like low key put up my hand. So just keep or I'll, I'll put in the chat um, and then um, basically I'll count down and I'll, I'll let you know when 20 minutes is up if it does go that far. And then after that, we're going to uh, have questions from the committee is certainly uh, coming from the externals. And after that, we'll uh, sequester ourselves or we'll get you to leave the zoom room and uh, we'll stop recording and then we're going to chat it through and ideally your supervisor will be able to keep you up to date on the final uh, decision okay oh did it come out you yes, are now you are now with us yes good i clicked only 50 times on each and finally it well, okay. so, I'm sorry, Isabel. I haven't seen you for so long, and it's okay. I guess the excitement of this <laughs> message of this meeting is made my system off. Yeah. So, so um, it was probably it's probably a good idea, given issues of bandwidth, if everyone but Isabel turns their camera off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, Isabel, um, just to make sure everything's working from your end, let's let's have you share screen. Excellent. OK, so what, whenever you're ready. I'd just like to make a small disclaimer. I'm sorry. I actually have a bad cold right now. Luckily, it's not COVID. <laughs> so I'm sorry if, for coughing. And uh, I may need to blow my nose every now and then. That's not a comment on anyone's comments. <laughs> and. Uh, Hopefully I don't have any coughing fits, but I have plenty of water with me. So hopefully everything goes well. No problem. It's all good. All right. Thank As you. you. Okay. So Make that feel better that we're on the Zoom, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sharing anything. <laughs> exactly. Apart from knowledge. So post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD presents our society with circumstances that impact an individual's human condition. Each person is shaped by the positive and negative elements of human existence, birth, development, death, love, emotionality, morality, aspiration, and conflict all play into the foundation of an individual. When reviewing PTSD as an influencer of the human condition, it is clearly one of the negative factors, acting as a possible deterrent or a regressor of development. When considering how military personnel are affected by PTSD, a large factor is their environment. Upon returning from deployment, though they are situated in what seems to be a safe setting, the design of their environments can provide or can prove to be an obstacle in their well being. For decades, we have been designing for the well being of various health concerns outside of the hospital setting. For instance, the Paimio Sanatorium 
It was designed for those suffering from tuberculosis in order to seek alternative treatment away from the city center. The Maggie centers throughout the United Kingdom are aimed at aiding cancer patients outside of their chemotherapy and radiation treatments or the Alzheimer's village in Pax, France, which seamlessly cares for its residents while enduring an irreversible condition. We care and adapt surroundings for our elderly through facilities such as this one, the Geriatric Center Donstolt in Vienna, Austria. Spas such as the Therm Vals provide mental and physical respite from the everyday. And more and more, our cities are being changed by the need for accessibility for the physically disabled. These examples demonstrate how for varying conditions, designers have been able to adapt the built world to positively influence and aid in the day-to-day -day happenings of human life. PTSD is a condition that largely requires a variety of types and variable durations of therapy in order to overcome and experience trauma. When it comes to those who have served in the armed forces in active conflicts abroad, their stressors and traumas were frequently relived on a daily basis. This is also a case where the trauma is not merely physical, but psychological and emotional. As stated by Susan Pease Bennett, PTSD is a whole body tragedy, an integral human event of enormous proportions with massive repercussions. Trauma creates change you don't choose. Healing creates change you do. Michelle Ronstadt, or Rosenthal, sorry. <laughs> Healing from trauma may occur in multiple ways in every individual and as every individual responds differently to every situation. And yet we do not have buildings dedicated to addressing the, this condition or the potential means by which we could aid those distressed by PTSD. Retired general and PTSD advocate, Romeo Dallard once said, PTSD has a terminal side to it that calls for more urgency. According to Veterans Affairs Canada, there are approximately 65,000 regular force members and 25,000 reservist members currently serving in Canada's military. Between those combined 90,000 individuals serving and those who have left the armed forces, as of March 31st, 2021, 31,336 veterans were receiving a disability benefit due to a psychiatric diagnosis. But more specifically, of those 31,300 36 individuals, 21,160 of them have a formal PTSD diagnosis. PTSD is a condition that may arise from a single short-lived event, a long-term experience, or a reoccurring experience, all of which include a form of trauma. However, not all people who experience a trauma will obtain a PTSD diagnosis. A critical factor is the diagnosis of PTSD is not only the type of symptoms, but also their duration. Symptoms of PTSD fall into three categories, re-experiencing, avoidance slash numbing, and hyperarousal. Yet one who is diagnosed with PTSD must show symptoms from all three of the categories, must experience them for more than a month, and must demonstrate a significant amount of distress and inability to lead a normal life. Therapy for PTSD may be approached any number of ways since each individual will experience their own set of symptoms and or triggers. As a result, clinicians employ any number of therapy methods, including but not limited to the list here. As a result, these methodologies require a multitude of spaces, some similar and some quite different to facilitate the necessary activities for therapeutic advancement. Therefore, this begs the question, what is it that distinguishes veterans from not only the average person, but what distinguishes them as particular cases of PTSD? I believe the answer lies in their training. Urban areas are expected to be the future battlefield and military operations, including combat in urban areas cannot be avoided. History is replete with examples of major urban battles from sieges of fortified cities during the Middle Ages to more recent battles such as Baghdad, Basra, and Gronzi. With the end of the Cold War and an increase in ethnic conflicts, political unrest, and civil war in industrial countries, the wars have become more frequent. Urban areas and urban populations have grown significantly during the late 20th century and have begun to play a much greater role in military operations. As part of their tactical training, servicemen and women learn about the various forms of urban development and how they may affect their defensive, offensive, and support decision-making. These images are taken from one of the tactical training manuals of the Canadian Armed Forces. We can begin to see an education in urban development. 
This sampling demonstrates how they are being taught to be critical of their built world as a means of survival. Protection, dispersion, concealment, fields of fire, covered routes, observation, fire hazards, and time available are the major factors that affect this decision making. These considerations have resulted in sets of tactical movement uh, techniques and are considered an essential skill set for operating in an urban war setting. These skills are not only employed for the safety of the individual, but to take into consideration working as a unit and in conjunction with large, a larger organization of units. All of these techniques, amongst many others, coupled with the fact that soldiers are to constantly evaluate their environments in three dimensions, means that absolutely any built environment has the potential to feel like a threat. And it is important to note that these techniques are meant to be performed in groups with the support of comrades. Therefore, operating in a space alone can become overwhelming. These men and women are trained to be rapid shifts both physically and intellectually when it comes to applying force in any number of situations. When a condition such as PTSD is factored in with these learned survival habits, it acts as a disruptor and brings in the irrational influence to the daily decision-making and environmental evaluations. As a result, <clears throat> my thesis has been revolving around the following research questions. How can architecture play a role in PTSD? How may the visual, tactile, and auditory training of military personnel inform the manner in which therapeutic spaces for sufferers of PTSD are designed? And what design elements will contribute the most to a facility for behavioral health therapy? These have been the critical themes of this thesis as environmental design factors are frequently reported by veterans as triggers for further distress when they have returned to their peacetime homes. The once familiar becomes the foe and what were once predictable reactions become the unpredictable. They become sensitive and vulnerable in some of the most seemingly innocent of spaces. It is not possible to completely eliminate these characteristics of the environment, but it is possible to treat them differently in order to minimize the stressors. It is thus necessary to work towards a human-centered design. Environmental gerontologist Esther Semsei Greenhouse describes this as design based on the physical and psychological needs of the human user, enabling the user to function at the highest level possible. Human-centered design is not a design style, but a process for designing and developing buildings, products, and communities that is grounded in information about the people who will be using them. Ultimately, the goal here is to create an architecture that can facilitate therapeutic treatments specifically for veterans, while attempting to not exacerbate their symptoms of PTSD prior to reaching their therapy space. This brings about the concept of architectural... Uh, Sorry. Uh, this brings about the concept of architectural phenomenology, whereby it is the totality of our experiences, memories, senses, haptic senses, and emotions that we experience spaces in the world. When taking a veteran into consideration with their traumatic experiences and memories, the hypervigilance with which they are trained to exude in order to stay safe and keep others safe, we can begin to understand how even peaceful settings cause extreme reactions. <clears throat> Each individual is said to have a comfort zone. It is a space, be it mental or physical, where they feel safe, are not challenged with opportunities for risk or growth. The comfort zone is filled with routine, familiarity, control, and security. This provides individuals with a critical space for self-care and recovery. However, it is important to leave this zone in order to experience personal growth and avoid stagnation. Outside of the comfort zone lies the learning zone where a person can begin to test their boundaries, experience their optimal anxiety and learn to operate differently or relearn a previous manner of operating. Here a person learns to extend their comfort zone, redefining it to include small portions of what was pre previously fearful. However, if a person pushes or is pushed too far and too quickly, they will end up in the fear zone, a debilitating state that could cause seemingly irrational outbursts and a quick retreat to the comfort zone. As an individual works incrementally through the learning zone, the fear zone can then be diminished until the, the given fear is overcome. It is at this point that a person experiences the growth zone, a place where they are able to fully move forward away from their fear, thus redefining the comfort zone. 
This model becomes instrumental when considering the process by which veterans afflicted with PTSD are meant to overcome their difficulties. Their conflict with their peacetime surrounding may manifest in both the physical and psychological realm. Comfort zones are created when ultimate control is ex exercised <clears throat> over all surrounding conditions, which is not always possible, especially when considering the intricacies of the built world. Military tactics teach soldiers and officers to operate in a manner critical of their surroundings and to find fault or advantage in the buildings they encounter. This in turn contributes to their anxieties when attempting to operate in their peacetime home countries. And these factors can be found in a multitude of buildings, presenting challenges when designing an institution for the progression of their psychological betterment. In this diagram, <clears throat> the colors have not been haphazardly selected. They coincide with the NATO standing operating procedure for markings in urban operations, and therefore have deeper significance for those in the military. Green represents an all clear safe space, yellow indicates the need for aid, blue designates a booby trap or danger, and red represents a cleared entrance. Going forward, the diagrams are coded using these colors, where green represents the element of security and safety, yellow indicates situations meant to employ optimal anxiety, blue designates elements of fear, and red represents the path to growth. Depicted as a commonly described condition of comfort for military personnel, when alone, they prefer to take a stance where their backs are against a solid wall, or better yet, to a corner. They can feel safety in that their backs are covered by a reliable and strong material, or at least mostly protected from surprise attack. Meanwhile, the field of vision for defense is reduced, so they are, they are responsible for responding to and defending a far smaller area before them. While this principle cannot be universally applied, it begins to inform how other principles may be developed to reduce anxiety within the various spaces of a building. To explore design and programmatic concepts, I have used an existing building in Ottawa. What you see here is the original plan for one of the satellite campuses for the Eastern Ontario Institute of Technology, later known as Algonquin College. All of these buildings have been reassigned based on a larger program and renovated to suit the new use while also becoming barrier free. Building A has taken on therapeutic needs of this thesis. Building B has become a public gallery to support some of the therapeutic endeavors performed in Building A. Building C is a community oriented center aimed to integrate veterans with the larger community. And Building D has retained its function as a gymnasium to help serve more physical therapeutic methods. While all the buildings have proposed changes, Building A is the center of the design concept exploration for this thesis. In this exploration, Building A has not only been renovated, but retrofitted with additional stories. The ground floor is largely public and socially oriented with workshops, a resource center, a cafe, and designated staff area. The only programmatic exception to this is a 24-hour crisis center, which is there for accessibility ease. The second floor becomes more privatized by being a floor designated for more traditional therapeutic pursuits. And all floors above are open to additional programming based on growing needs and to afford rental space for additional services and potentially for research. What follows now are general design principles tailored to the needs of veterans with PTSD. As a mid-century modern design, this building has a strong existing structural grid plan with a fair amount of regularity and repeating dimensions. Therefore, it has been used to regulate the plan for the new programmatic endeavors. However, this grid plan was developed with a public space in mind. Therefore, when moving into a more private function of the building, is there a better proportion to consider? For all of the additional stories, I propose employing the proportions of Le Corbusier's modular. The use of the modular on these subsequent stories that serve more private and intimate functions aims to bring the proportions of the spaces to a human scale. Taking on such an anthropomorphic scale allows for users to experience spaces that are built for the human body instead of forcing the human body to adapt to an arbitrary building measurement. Anthropometrics, anthropom anthropometric metrics <clears throat> applied to building design are meant to make the environment as comfortable as possible. Therefore, a 2.26 meter by 2.26 meter grid was aligned with certain factors of the first story grid 
and applied to all subsequent stories with a 3.66 meter floor to ceiling height. This design relies primarily on three building materials, steel, concrete, and glass. Each one represents a varying level of vulnerability as they have very different advantages and disadvantages in the eyes of servicemen and women with regards to their training and tactical methodologies. This tells us that concrete is predominantly considered the strongest and most reliable material and therefore represents comfort and safety in this building. It is represented in green. Steel is evalu evaluated as a potentially weaker material in the military at is as it is largely associated with light frame construction. This accordingly represents a point of vulnerability, yet is not completely unreliable. Therefore, steel represents a material of manageable anxiety. Here, the steel structure is bridging the gap between comfort and vulnerability by being integrated into systems that support both concrete and glass simultaneously. It is represented in yellow. Glass is the material of ultimate vulnerability. Its full transparency and fragility make it the weakest material when considering a building for a defensible position. However, in this proposal, the use of glass is meant to flip the concept of vulnerability. While glass leaves a person visually exposed, it also exposes the surroundings the person is experiencing, providing advance warning, ergo allowing someone to better prepare for what is coming. Additionally, this material can be manipulated to varying degrees for varying purposes. It is represented in blue. The just juxtaposition of these materials at various moments is meant to provide clients with opportunities to explore which levels of vulnerability they are able to comfortably navigate. The application of the materials highlights the extent to which the built environment plays a role in certain cases of PTSD. When the vertical surfaces are assigned these colors, or these color values, is then translate, it then translates to the floor plan and influences how someone might choose to move through the, the, the floor plans. Thus, it becomes necessary to evaluate the factors that affect these horizontal paths of travel. Among the first interventions related to horizontal paths of travel, I propose the use of overhangs on the exterior structure. Since the exterior walls are heavily glazed, the use of overhangs provide a sense of protection. Additionally, by using a strong horizontal surface expressed through concrete, there is a juxtaposition of materials to support each other. Next, we want to consider corridors. These are inherent places of vulnerability and more so when space is limited. Close proximity with strangers can be triggering. Therefore, we want to open corridors to be wider than what basic requirements call for. To further improve corridors, I propose to aim for corridors that primarily engage veterans on one, only one side. By doing so, we reduce the field of vision veterans feel the need to evaluate. We can provide a wall of reassurance to one side while letting them visually assess a far less complex portion of their environment. And where there are corridors, there are thresholds or doorways leading to the adjacent, adjacent spaces. Doors are typically anxiety inducing because of the questionable element of what is beyond. Tactical training teaches veterans to move as a unit and support each other to travel through all thresholds. Therefore, my first move is to make the doors completely glazed and then to expand the glazing past the door frame to, a clear, to clear a larger field of view into the adjacent space. What is shown here is a proposed setup for two group therapy spaces. By stretching the glazing across a larger surface area, these clients are immediately given far more information about their surroundings as they cross from one space to another. Here we have a diagram from another group therapy room. Considering the narrowness of the space, the entire wall has been glazed to afford the client a broader visual field. Here, the resource center also employs glazed doorways, but is stepped in, creating a buffer zone as one transitions from space to space. Another aspect for consideration is how vertical openings in buildings are configured, including atriums and mezzanines. These spaces are of particular concern for veterans due to their natural propensity to evaluate them for threats posed by a sniper. When we look at this diagram, it's easy to see that overall atriums are not safe in almost any configuration. 
the only place you see some advantage would be bottom of atrium one when someone is on the far side of the overhang. Nevertheless, I do not think they should be avoided. I think they should be used as a tool. Therefore, I have included one with varying profile considerations. While it is mostly straight in profile, there are instances of staggering away from the center of the atrium, providing more cover. Furthermore, the atrium is largely enclosed in glazing to give a form of barrier. Having considered this multitude of factors and how they can affect their immediate environment for veterans, we can take these color-coded floor plans and create optimal paths of travel with regards to getting to a desired destination. Here we have proposed paths of travel between the main entrance and all possible destinations within the building's first two stories. The bars below the, each map show how the materials and the environment factors could affect someone based on the path they choose. No path exists with only one condition. Instead, it demonstrates how a client can vary their movements in order to work on their personal obstacles. In order to travel between stories, vertical paths of travel need to be considered too. When considering stairs, typically they are enclosed areas and winding in nature, making them dangerous to veterans. Therefore, it is important to create as much advance warning as possible. To do so, I propose that stairs need to be one constructed without risers and use either spindled or glass balustrades. Additionally, approaches to the stairwells should be glazed. The walls per perpendicular them to uh, the walls perpendicular to them should be solid, and stairs should be floated away from the walls. The combination of these design factors takes advantage of how light, shadow, and sound travel, providing veterans with a multisensorial experience that will help them to cope with traveling through this sensitive space. And at every landing, they are given a place with a safety wall to recoup if in distress. To address elevators, I also propose an extensive use of glazing on the elevator shaft and car. It allows for clients to have more awareness of their position in terms of vertical travel, be able to prepare for what is to be expected either inside or outside of the elevator, and have advance warning of other passengers. Within this exploration, three elevators were proposed, two of which were positioned backing onto a wall and one sitting fully exposed. Therefore, there is variability between their surroundings and potential uh, challenge for veterans. Due to their physical benefits, nature and water are highly encouraged for integration into therapeutic settings. Regardless of scale, a potted plant versus a massive tree, a desktop water feature versus a roaring ocean, nature and water have proven to be beneficial. Therefore, this site proves to be ideal in this factor. There is an abundance of land among the Rideau River to provide varying landscape settings, meeting the nature and water goals of diverse groups of people. Additionally, nature and water can be integrated into the interior of the building uh, like this through pools and fountains and interior gardens, living walls and potted plants. Isabella, just uh, keep in mind uh, time to start wrapping things up. Okay. Um, so I'll actually skip down to my conclusion. <laughs> um, the slides that follow were are all were all within my document, and so these are all the specialized spaces that have been considered for the 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 exploration. Um, so we can there's questions we can run back to them, but uh, designing for PTSD can be counterintuitive. In one respect, the goal has been to remove the element of surprise, which in the average person is a driving force for creativity and discovery in architecture. In another respect, to create elements of challenge to promote growth for veterans, design must at times be counterintuitive to their training. However, we can skirt the, line, the lines uh, of these conditions with particular concepts. First off, by simply creating facilities like these, there is acknowledgement of a serious health concern affecting our veterans, making them feel seen and heard and offering a concrete path forward in terms of mental health care. By having this dedicated facility, we can work to destigmatize mental health issues, particularly in the military. This in return brings in the strong sense of camaraderie. 
The potential isolation one feels during a mental health struggle can be overpowering and not being able to, to identify with those around them can compound the issue. Military personnel are trained to work as units and feel most secure and comfortable in the company of fellow servicemen and women. Therefore, this architectural endeavor, one, brings veterans together in a common goal where they can work together and help each other. Two, provides group and community programs with therapeutic outcomes. And three, makes the primary occupants of the building trained servicemen and women, therefore potentially making, making it even the slightest bit easier to trust the unknown people around them. Second, thresh, uh, thresholds and transitions provide serious moments of vulnerability and can be triggering. As previously discussed, they need to be treated differently in order to reveal honest spaces. Third, mind and body link the pause Mind and body link the positive effects of physical exercise and exertion with emotional and psychological growth. Overall, on the site, there are a variety of elements and programs to do uh, to do this both through sport and or occupational therapy. Fourth and most importantly, is the concept of awareness. Not only does such a facility create community awareness of how one may positively emerge from the challenges of combating PTSD, but this architecture aims to engage in a veteran's personal awareness. In challenging their comfort zone, they can learn to become more aware of themselves and their needs, truly question why something is triggering, bring those questions to a clinician, and ultimately find a resolution or a coping strategy in order to lead a healthier life. Architecture does not claim to be the healer of people. However, it can be the vessel in which healing can be attained. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, so uh, just in the interest of time, uh, very quickly, uh, would there be any questions from the committee and certainly <clears throat> to, the, to the externals, um, uh, any questions of clarification? All, all right, then. Um, if the, oh, Mitch, were you going to say something? No, no. I was going to say uh, no questions of clarification. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I guess just uh, to warm up the crowd, um, as is tradition, I will throw the first uh, open round of questions to uh, Professor Papa Theodoru, just so you can kind of acclimatize everyone else to, uh, <coughs> and I'll to go to the externals, all right? Um, <laughs> I wasn't prepared to ask a question. Sorry, man. <laughs> That's okay. Um, if somebody else has a question, I'll give it some more thought. And okay, so I guess I'll throw it to, well, Mitchell, you seem fairly engaged on this one. So I guess you'll be taking the first volley. Sure. Uh, I wanted to start out by saying, uh, I think this is a really uh, kind of amazing topic to take on. Um, obviously, mental health uh, is, is pretty difficult to deal with. And then to try to deal with it through architecture is kind of um, um, an, an extra level of complexity. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of was wondering about mainly, um, it, it, it kind of goes to a program, programmatic question for me. Like it seems like there is, uh, the duration is really what's important in this, in this uh, diagnosis. And then it seems like there's pretty limited um, facilities for people to actually stay here. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a bit. Yeah, so- I have some follow-ups. <laughs> yeah. What comes next? Uh, yeah, so it, it's actually, like, the history of PTSD is actually quite complex and it's come in and out of recognition. And so it's only, it was actually only formally recognized in the DSM in 1980 in the DSM-3, so the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Health. And so they, they have been over the years piecing it together to create hard qualifiers to be able to diagnose it. And so um, it actually, I don't find that the, the, diagno the, the time limit is actually too harsh, I would say. Um, especially when we're talking about such a specific group who deals with the worst of the worst. <laughs> like we can look to Ukraine right now. And I think this is one of the first times that we're really having a raw look at things and seeing what people 
are truly experiencing. And so I don't think it's, it's hard for them to have those symptoms for that month period and to experience over long term. Oh, no, um, totally. I, yeah. I, I totally understand that. And I'm wondering almost why, like, that's kind of the minimum. And you're going to have people who experience this for months and years. And yeah. so it seems like there's a very limited kind of stay component. I almost imagine people coming here to this place of, of kind of respite and therapy. And then they go to like, this is, this is a, 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 an illness that's so affected or so kind of like triggered by the urban environment. So it's kind of inseparable from mm -hmm. if somebody flies in here to get treated and then has to go back to a hotel and they're kind of re triggered again. So yeah. just, I was kind of wondering if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah. So I, I particularly picked Ottawa because it is a, uh, a fairly large military center like that that's where I grew up my dad is military so that's part of my segue into to why I led into this topic and so I would like I would actually like it to be a widespread thing so that it could be a re potentially repeated or expanded upon in multiple places and so that we would actually have facilities that are not hospital settings because hospitals um well, we're getting better with hospital design, I would say, like we're, we're doing more patient oriented um, consideration. Uh, there's still a large sterility to it because of the nature of it. And so there is that stigma that happens and people don't wanna necessarily go there or they, they feel the judgment. And so by doing something like this and by trying to make it more widespread, Ottawa was just a, like a jumping off point and the fact okay. that I uh, looked for a site and found an existing site that was a point of interest and that had a lot of benefits, but then also needs to be re reconfigured. So it, like, I, I didn't actually necessarily consider the fact of someone like needing to fly in and come and be treated here. Um, another, like another factor to consider if, if that were the ins were a situation is that there's the potential that someone could just get posted in order for their treatment because the military is becoming more um more accepting of of personal needs there's a lot more recognition we're finally getting that wall being broken down i would say so i i didn't necessarily consider it like that's a, a good point as it being like something temp or for someone a temporary occupant i guess you could say like a, or a temporary occupant of ottawa so someone that's trying to come back and forth um, cause ideally by choosing this kind of program where it is just, uh, somewhere you go to and you, you purposely leave afterwards is that you're still living in your home environment and you're still getting all that support that you do, or hopefully the support that you do have. And so that it is giving that challenge outside of the facility too, um, so that you are still fully experiencing things. Cause at one point in consideration, there was the thought of maybe doing three different uh, facilities and them each being uh, varying degrees of um, experience. So like one could be a whole like resort, essentially, yeah, like a resort so that like if someone were in an extreme state of distress and very unable to cope, they could actually go here and stay for a, a given period of time and be largely overseen by a professional so that they will get the appropriate care and diagnosis because there are so many multitude of factors that can go into a diagnosis and it could be coinciding with another diagnosis. Um, and yeah, so there's like one that would be like, you go there, you stay there, and maybe like you live in a bit of seclusion to be able to start to have a healing process. Having an inter, like this is essentially what we were thinking of as like an intermediate place. So you could go and you experience therapeutic activity. And then yeah. maybe there's another one that's a very public, um, but more or informational so that it is, it's giving that engagement. Yeah, I think, I think that's actually part of, of kind of what, as I was reading the thesis, like things that were coming into my mind were that this seems almost like it's an extreme, um, like towards the more healed end. Of, of the, I, I don't know if that's the right term. So sorry if, I, if I'm if i misspeaking here, but. Oh no. It, it feels like. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it feels like there's a. It's almost a bit um, provocative of of. Uh, how do I say this? Provocative of kind of the symptoms, like like the exposure is almost extreme in in the way you've described it. Um, yeah. So, so it seems sorry. like there's a lot of glass as opposed to kind of having like a number of different spaces that people can filter through. So I, I, I was also hoping you could speak to that a bit. Like why, why such, so, like so much exposure in terms of the kind of rules that you set up? Yeah, so um, it, it, it is like there, there is a crisis center and, and of course there's, a, there's the reality that there has to be the acceptance that this is not somewhere where everyone will go. There will be instances where part of the idea of the crisis center was that maybe it's more, it's easier to go ask for help from the familiar. So looking at, at like part of my envisionment also is that you have military employed here also. So you see people in uniform, like as a kid that I'm totally accustomed to seeing people in uniform. My dad's artillery, big guns are no big deal. <laughs> um, like when I'm in Toronto, I feel thrown off because I don't see anyone in uniform and I live right by Moss Park. So like the armory is there. <laughs> and so I, like, I think that there's, there's a component that like, if you have the center, which has a familiar aspect and has that integration and you know that there, it's a, not um, a place for judgment that you would be more willing to seek there. And then you can be evaluated and things can be shifted around based on what the true needs of a person is who is struggling with their PTSD. And like, I, I did go, <laughs> I did go with it, a fair amount of exposure um, <laughs> because I think that it's integral in, in, in learning where, in, in trying to relearn how glass is actually still a barrier of sorts. And the fact that it's not necessarily something that is entirely detrimental to a person and that there's many advanced, like it's a, I was thinking in the terms of retraining to think of glass in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that we're not just thinking like, oh, we're always vulnerable, but we end up seeing everything. So you end up having, you also get tons, the other factors is that like, it brings in tons of natural light, which is great for circadian rhythms and regulating hormones. Um, you're getting to be, have good views of the nature. So it's something that even in a uh, study show that even in the peripheral vision, uh, looking at having water and nature helps people to, uh, to load, lower their stress levels. Um, mm -hmm. So it's trying to pull on all the things that are positives and reprogram the idea of glass and glazing. I, though, but if you have someone who is a very extreme case, mm -hmm. uh, who's feeling very vulnerable, like what's the kind of, I, I would have almost imagined that there was some degree of, like I, I, read, I read the entirety of it. And so like the, I, the thing that stuck out to me was the atrium where you, you actually like got into how you could make it feel more protected. And I feel like there's a lower level of exposure. So why wasn't it three atriums as opposed to one? So one atrium that has fully stepped uh, like tiers mm -hmm. so that you kind of, you, you walk through and you can expose yourself to the idea of an atrium while still being protected. And mm -hmm. then a tier up from that, that, that gives you more exposure and kind of like, because the, the idea with exposures is that they're incremental and it's not all at once because it can be overwhelming. Yeah. So like, especially because there was such, um, like, and this kind of goes to a bit, like I get, getting away from the program, but a bit more of an architectural critique. Why, why was there such a focus on building a, um, having those floors added? Like, it, it feels like there's enough space in this complex that you could have just dealt with the buildings yeah. that were there and you demolished the building, which I think in itself was kind of this beautiful um, um, kind of metaphor of, of exactly what you're talking about. Like, there's this kind of, um, simple holistic thing that was built and then something else happened to it and 
and then it, it was like you decided to remove it. So, uh, B- building I, E is questions. actually horrendous. Sorry, <laughs> building E is actually horrendous. <laughs> like, it doesn't fit. It doesn't go there. Um, yeah, I, I like particularly enjoy the analogy. Isn't having... that mm-hmm. sorry? Isn't that a, like a metaphor for this kind of injury? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, like I, I, that's why I appreciated using an existing building instead of going from scratch. Like, granted, we could all build anything from scratch from the ground up, but using an existing building and reevaluating it and finding what is useful, what is not, uh, what is of value, and then it's also this building has slipped. This complex had slipped into disrepair. And so it's injured too. And so in doing this, it's bringing it back into a true purpose. And, uh, and it's, it's about teaching people, uh, like it's a former school and it's about teaching people but in a completely different manner. And so with regards to the atrium, the other component, like I, I did don't, only went with one, um, but part of the idea is also how we're moving around it or how, what, but, uh, experiences are available around it and so how it can be uh the, it, it's it's really funny to just like look at tactics and then look at how very specific um a position will be just within a hallway mm-hmm. and so if you're if you they're using these kind of mentalities to move through the space and then it's finding where are you wavering in and out of that manageable anxiety and it could also like granted with the exposure it could mean that like you end up moving through the space with someone I I think that's like a very small ask um, that there be behavioral changes based are from the clinician side so if it means that like someone like a a client is triggered just from their drive and they're coming to this building and they don't know how they're going to handle it call up your clinician and they can meet you at the door And they help you move through and they help you go like reassess, like ground yourself and and find those things. So while like I'm looking, I mostly wrote about the ideas of the veteran and how they're supposed to be experiencing it and moving through the space. I think that there's also just a lot of accommodation that can be made um, from a professional side. And then, um, yeah, so the the extra space. So again, it was, there's a trying, uh, an attempt to distinguish like private versus public, like figuring out what things are more group oriented and then what is more serious and giving that change. And then there's putting additional space up there is in part the, uh, an idea of one way that we can continue funding a program like this and a building like this. So, so we can also integrate far more services that would be veteran oriented. So like people who need physiotherapy, um, there needs to be a ton more research. And so um, in the precedence in the example of the Alzheimer village, one of the buildings in there is actually just a observational command center, if you will. And people sign in or sign up to research Alzheimer's there. And so it actually, the entire space is integrated for full observation. Um, So, I'm thinking that like there could be a component of that too and you using experiencing the building and seeing maybe reaction and having other forms of research because the <clears throat> the expanse of research within PTSD it expands pa- past psychological there are physical components to it where we're looking at traumatic brain injury and how that triggers personality changes and therefore psychological disorders and so on and so forth so there's I was focused on working on the therapy, but the putting those extra stories up there was an acknowledgement that there could be so much more that could be done. And so even if it was only one floor instead of an extra three, it's still there as a potential. And you know, what happens also if the, this is not a, um, the, the capacity of what is designed and proposed here um, becomes, it is overwhelmed. So then we need more. So we, and um, earlier on <clears throat> in my defenses, there was also the question of like, why veterans specifically? Mm-hmm. And it's because 
statistically, they are the largest group suffering from PTSD. They are also largely considered the worst case of PTSD and they have the longest duration in most cases. Um, and like PTSD includes so much like assault, rape, violence, abuse, all these things. Um, but they, these things are very, have, typically have very unique environmental factors to the person versus a group. So it, it, that's, that's part of the reason why veterans are honed in on specifically. Yeah. I, I'll say I, I really appreciated kind of draw the parallels that you drew between the kind of movements of military like veterans and and the way you kind of designed the space to kind of make them feel safer. Um, yeah, thanks. So just uh, in the interest of trying to get as much, so that was a lot of stuff there. Thanks, Mitch. Um, but I would like to throw it to Drew. Thanks, Mitch, for great comments. Thanks, Vince. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. And uh, I, I echo Mitch's comments. Uh, I read I read your book in entirety. Um, lovely. I love Thank a lot you. of the uh, things. I, I don't think you had time to even to, to perhaps squeeze into the 20 minutes of presentation. Uh, so I guess I'll yeah. focus my, my, my um, thoughts about some of the things I hope you can speak about if mm -hmm. there is time. Um, so... Can we put the sound a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I didn't flip down my, my thing. <laughs> my hearing, my apologies. Did you, did you uh, were you able to hear me? <laughs> Should I repeat? Yes. We're all, we're all good. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. I forgot I had it up. Um, so so just there, there's lots of questions. I was making notes while while you were presenting and, and listening to the, um, the feedback and the you know discussion. There's lots here, actually. So much that I don't know how to pick the best <laughs> direction. So I'll just take a, you know, a, a, kind of, you know, just a guess here. A couple couple words I was trying to figure out, just trying to understand now, like seeing your presentation, it's so so vivid, right? After reading the text. So it just shows, you know, Zoom or physical, just amazing to hear your passion about the subject, how mm -hmm. you see so much that still needs to be done in terms of, if, again, apologies for not understanding it uh, uh, well enough, but but just um, with the precedence, uh, one thought I had was, and you touched on it actually a minute ago about you know you your decision to find a existing building to rebuilt you know to to retrofit, uh, make some changes, versus something that's you said from the ground up, you know, like from from a purpose built structure or, or facility. And, and this ties into, I guess, a larger stream of thought I have that I really want to hear more about. And part of me after reading your book and I saw the site plan and even the sequencing, if you could maybe flip back, please. I don't know if you could uh, uh, see that site plan. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's the correct term that you're using. Um, you know, maybe re reference nature and water. That That's great mm -hmm. actually, just to see how you, how you labeled it because that I think speaks so vividly about some of the things that you have in your book that that I didn't hear enough about in your presentation. So maybe, you know, uh, some of the thoughts I was thinking of is um, maybe a precedent would be something like, I was trying to think of the best way to frame the, frame this, but I don't know if you're familiar with the, the, the Diana Memorial in, in uh, UK. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if you had a chance to see it, or if you do get a chance to see it, it's great because I think it is a nice way of speaking about some of these things that you're, you're introducing into the retrofit of this site, right? With how to make it work. So, so I guess my, my question or thoughts I wanna hear you talk about are this kind of you know, preface to it, two scales. One scale has to do with the entirety, like the site that, that talks about, you know, the entirety of an experience for, for um, I guess I'm, my curiosity is for one individual. I know you don't have time for this, but just even to pick up on some of the threads earlier in, in the discussion um, that were introduced, how does someone and how long does someone, one individual who is using this facility, go through all those sequences of steps, the, the sequencing of, you know, from the threshold of arrival, we talked about, you know, coming in on a plane, there's so many steps, right, involved until you're actually in this place. And then how does that one individual move and navigate through the space with support? I guess not being an expert in this field, I had to make a lot of 
not assumptions, but it, to me, it wasn't, it wasn't scripted in a way that I can fully understand. I did appreciate the frozen images of say the the um, entourage that you had in your plans those were it was the red outlines or sorry I don't know if that's the right color but you know the the figures that you had in your diagrams and especially in your plans and uh, uh, kind of you know perspectives of the staircases those things really started to answer that question but the the, the maybe the figure and the relationship of the figures I guess with some kind of uniform of everyone's plain clothes or however this however this would work was a little bit for me, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to grasp it. So, so that's just my miss, miss, um, uh, my, my, my ability not to be able to grasp it from the individual point and the scale, how the sequence works, right? How that, you know, in order to fully appreciate what you, what you're giving us and the, the, the thoughts I had, I really would love to hear you speak about again with nature about, you know, and also the purpose, purpose built setting is the size of this facility and the seasonality and how, big does something have to be for this idea for the satisfactions you have that's a translation of your passion for the subject right like i guess i guess i'll say it part of me is wondering was the site too big of a thing to 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 tackle to to take it to all those levels of finesse that you are it's it's obvious that you are so aware of exactly how a facility should be designed all the way down to you know the kind of cups and the kinds of shoes or clothing and all the, all that stuff right from, from the macro to the micro so so i guess that the porous versus the sealed the the transformable versus the fixed the 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 thing that's beautiful in its scars and never finished a la scarpa's philosophy versus something that is fully fully you know permanent like like a like like, like an object so these are some of the thoughts that I had wanting to, you know, walk me through the way your, 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 your satisfaction for, for realizing it as, as a, you know, um, the landscape, like this image to me is so powerful because of the, the phenomenological ideas you introduced in the text and the uh, uh, healing that the plants do. You know, to me, it seems like a landscape project would be almost enough with a tiny pavilion building or something you know I, i'm just trying to grapple with the size and scale of things um yeah so those, are, those are a whole bunch of thoughts there i, I don't know which, pick whichever one you like <laughs> to talk um, about so yeah the, the site is is fairly large uh, for sure like the site itself and then the building complex it is fairly large and so that's why there was the focus set over to building a the other buildings were really just generalized and easier moves I'll say um so they didn't go through they didn't need to go through really dramatic changes and especially since um it's a, also again like building a is moving into a privatized concept so like everything ground floor is thought of as public but as you move across the site you get a more privatized side and then it moves up into even more privatization. And so what actually, what kind of helped because it is a large <laughs> amount of space is that that back chunk or I think like this back chunk here is actually not removed necessarily by me. <laughs> um, so the, the University of Ottawa actually currently bought this complex and uh, to expand their uh, their campus but mostly because they they built a giant football field right here so they actually knocked out a, bun a part of the building and so th this ended up going through different iterations in a sense because I approached it with the original building as it was fully complete and then and then eventually that got scrapped and there was the embracing of what was already taken out. So it's a, a chunk of the building is missing um, on its own. So it kind of adds to the, I guess you could say the poetry <laughs> that is taking something that is old and not being cared for or something that, that seems broken and not being cared for. And then re trying to reinvigorate it with new purpose, which is a uh, like the the analogies follow between therapeutic uh, pursuits and so on. And so this site is actually just like it's it's massive and has so much potential. And 
when I went there, I actually repeatedly went back to the site. Um, I experienced it in day, night, winter, spring, summer. And so that's why some of my photo documentation is snowy, but some isn't. And so I really appreciated how it created the quad is sitting there, an open-ended quad that looks onto the river. And so it was, they give, there's a lot of spaces that give serenity in nature and that just needed to be a little bit more reimagined for to be able to accommodate different pursuits and so like I have a I I have a a higher or I, I find I have a high preoccupation with barrier-free design and so I wanted to make sure that it is something that leads out for anyone and is accessible and makes things easier. And so there, of course, Ottawa gets some pretty gnarly winters. Um, so it's not something that may necessarily be fully experienced the same way, but it still can have some maintenance to it so that we can have exploration and there can be a component and it can be engaged with. And that programs can change accordingly uh, for the, in terms of any programmatic needs for a physical activity or exploration into that and how it gets integrated into um, therapeutic methods and how they're led and, and explored. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I brought in, like it, it's also it could just be a whole landscape architecture project going on on its own. And so I was bring I was really influenced by the book that's called um, Blue Mind. And it's a very interesting exploration of the benefits of water on the human condition and in every expanse. Therefore, like we can be having these outdoor spaces that maybe even if someone doesn't directly engage in it, the fact of having it there and um, having the peripheral vision of it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it will tend to have a, a positive effect on a person. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. That, and that's, uh, like I'm trying to run through things. <laughs> um, and that, that's, that's great. Uh, I, I, I didn't know about that book and that, that, that this helps a lot because I can see it's, it, it's, it's asking the viewer listener to to imagine the perspective of being uh, uh immersed in this wonderful landscape and it's always this you know the the, the view cones necessarily are this, the peripheral the way you're saying it's like this borrowed constantly borrowing and that's the the, the logic right of the porosity of the, the expanse of the glass like 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 a proof comments earlier right so so that that helps a lot thanks so with that, I just want to be mindful of time. Um, I will throw it now back to Professor Papa Theodoru, um, and and we'll also close off with any questions from the super as well. Thank you. So lots to think about. My question, which is fairly direct, is: Are you familiar with two sites in Toronto? One is the former psychiatric hospital on Lakeshore Boulevard, which. Uh, was built in the 19th century using patient labor as a form of therapy, um, gardening, farming, that sort of thing. And that's way out on Lake Shore Boulevard. You're nodding, right? That's great. And uh, do you yeah, know that? And, and there's, there's tons of studies that actually say that um, uh, like green, it's considered, they call it green therapy. And so it's the act of gardening and tending um, and exposure. Like it's, it's largely practiced in Japan where you'll see people just go fall asleep in parks um, and because they believe that uh, there's studies that show that exposure to plants and to soil we actually absorb minerals through our skin and yeah. they have um, antidepressant um, factors in or effects in them so full disclosure um, I was admitted to CAMH in the 1980s due to PTSD from architecture school I'm not oh. joking. <laughs> it was real. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> when I was there in the 80s, it was a brutalist structure. It was concrete. And I was fascinated about what you talked about, materials, et cetera. And it was concrete and glass and a bit of wood, you know, for the pieces you touch. It, it was an architecture that I've grown to appreciate in different ways over the decades. They've taken that all away now. And I'm wondering if this is, again, going beyond your thesis a little bit, but... 
but related, have you looked at, have you seen what has happened to CAMH and the kind of architecture of healing or otherwise that they might be, it's a public, it's a PP3 project, which means that it was developer driven <laughs> as well as, yeah. I think KPMB was the prime yeah. architect. And, and I've yeah. been, I haven't been inside it because I don't need to go in it anymore. And I found it to be rather corporate looking and sterile from the outside. <laughs> Are you familiar with it? And do you have any comments? Um, I know of the building. I haven't explored it myself. Actually, Shay McDougall um, from years ago, he uh, worked on it with us uh, through Stantec when he was working at Stantec. And um, so that that is the was part of the idea that I was trying to get away from is, is sterility and just how whenever we look at some whenever people address healthcare, there's a default into that sterile environment. And then that is what is a deterrent for people because of the site of it's studies have shown that people have who have healthier uh, psychological mindset from their environment heal faster like physically heal faster and um uh sorry i just had a brain fart <laughs> okay actually I, I you know this is something that's i think really interesting because you could go on and uh review or critique i mean i'm just thinking of the different roles that master students from university of formerly Ryerson, uh, the kind of work that, you know, where, where do you apply it? And where, where do you see the application of this kind of work? Maybe that's a better question. Yeah, because I find that one of the, I guess one of the best places or the best health care environments to go to are children's hospitals because they embrace fun. Like they, they embrace a child, they a childlike nature to make it less intimidating so like that's probably like maybe one of the best examples of of healthcare in a way when we look at a hospital that is still needing to be an element of sterile <laughs> and um and so yeah i i've i've seen a variety of of healthcare facilities in my lifetime <laughs> um and and seen the like the antiquated and and looked at when things were built and what the response was versus now. Like, for instance, when my grandfather was uh, dying in Nova Scotia, he was sitting in the old hospital that uh, was built many, like I think I looked it up and it was built in like the 1930s. And so like, there was a, there was a lot of pink tile for some reason. And, and you're looking at very antiquated things and trying to and reimagine like what healthcare response was then. And then actually the day of his passing was the day that he got transferred to the brand new hospital. And, and so like we, you want the change in seeing something that's like 1930s versus 2010s construction that you're just going, whoa, how different is this? And, but the older construction even had maybe something more of a, a hominess to it. I don't, like, not that it was the most stylish place, but it, it still had that component where there was a little more potential warmth to it and that there was maybe a different concept of exploration at that time versus now. The new hospital was also quite nice, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> it also just yeah. begs the question that how are things designed, a lot of the things that are desi uh, designed in terms of hospital settings are more geared towards the employees, which is entirely important, but it's also who is the critical user in that instance that yes, we wanna have organization and functionality for healthcare to be administered, but then also how can we improve upon someone's experience within the space. And so that's why the Paimeo Sanatorium was such a huge jump mm -hmm. at its time. So, so I, I, I do appreciate all, and honestly, the, the 
generous sharing of information on that. And then I'm glad everyone has the courage and feel comfortable talking about a topic that's so close to, to tune to people. Um, but uh, Professor Atkin, you are the supervisor, and I'll give you the last couple of minutes to chime in uh, because I just want to make sure we have enough time to deliberate after this. Um, thanks, Vince. Um, Isabel, I congratulate you on getting this work, this piece of work together as a thesis because it's a very good thesis. Uh, and for years, it looked like we'll never get it together, right? <laughs> um, because there's it's been a working been, catastrophe. <laughs> so many aspects, and there are so many dimensions, and there are so many psychological and human conditions involved. And on top of it, there was no war. So we were, we were so to speak, quiet, and Isabel worked very, very thoroughly, but not in a rush. I think that if she started her thesis now, she would be rushing through it in order to get the Ukrainian soldiers in on time. But it's also my question to her now is, if you knew that this is what is coming, wouldn't you add a floor of training of pre-service? When you expect people to come back from the war, you want them to come back to something that they're familiar with. And we didn't, you didn't take that into account. And therefore, uh, from some point of view, um, we've experienced, between two of us, we've experienced numerous, numerous hospitals between between our beginning of relationship and today and the last one at least i have experienced is bridgepoint which is all about glass and steel right and it's amazing how optimistic and how powerful that building is and i don't know if it's a good hospital or not maybe not Maybe, maybe Sunnybrook is a much more powerful hospital, even though being inside there is uh, God's punishment. Isabel, I congratulate you and I congratulate you on not giving up on uh, understanding of glass and role of seeing and role of awareness of safety and and so to speak, protection by seeing what's around you. It's not about glass defending you, glass defends you by allowing you to see what's behind it. Concrete may be a much stronger protection, but you have no idea what to expect. Anyways, uh, to sum it up, I congratulate you on putting together a very, very powerful piece of research. And uh, unlike, unlike other people, I see where you can be uh, employed very well and very soon and, and with great success because your, your thesis and your work show the capacity which most people don't have while getting out of the even graduate school. Excellent. And so uh, on that very positive and effusive note, I think it's time to say uh, goodbye to the audience and to um, you, Isabel. So congratulations. <laughs> and I believe uh, the committee will deliberate for a bit and um, Professor Eiken will come and email you back the results, okay? Yeah. So, so thank, thank you. you very much, Isabel. Um,